Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Hopefully a few more people will um, join us. Um, hello and welcome uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are AI Austin COPE. My name is Ashley Griswa and I am the chair elect for COPE for 2021. And also on the line, we have Kendall Klaus, our fearless leader and chair for this year. Um, we're really excited to have Gail Vittori joining us today and to be bringing you some shared content. Um, we're going to do a little preview of the AIU uh, course on health and wellness and um, then get into a great conversation with Gail. So um, before we get started, can everyone see my screen? Gail, your screen on. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you so much to our committee sponsors who make all of our events possible, uh, Indoor Weather Professionals, Pilgrim Building Company, and Hill and Wilkinson general contractors. Uh, we're very happy to have their support, especially uh, in this digital time, um, to, to be able to continue bringing you all content uh, this year. Again, like I said, Gail is joining us, um, and I will be sort of moderating a conversation with her following the video. Um, and um, we would also like to invite you to join us for our next event. Um, the fourth in our series. Sorry, I'm having a little slide trouble. Um, which will be taking place on June seventeenth. So um, please stay tuned to the website for more information and to register for that. But that will be the fourth of our AIU uh, content and live series. So today the content is health and wellness, and we'll be doing a preview. It's about a thirty-minute video. Um, that we'll be previewing from the AIU content with a conversation to follow. Um, if you guys have questions throughout, um, please put them in the Q&A and we'll have um, some space for audience questions uh, a little later in the presentation. Sometimes we've noticed with our other videos that the sound for the video comes through quite a bit quieter than the speakers. So if you guys wanna take a minute to turn up your volume a little bit um, and then we'll give you a few seconds to turn it back down before we uh, start shouting at you after the video is, is over. Um, if anyone has any issues uh, with the video, if the sound's not working or anything, please uh, put something in the chat. But hopefully uh, we tested it so it'll be all set. The first like 30 seconds of the video does not have sound. So if you can't hear something right away, don't panic. <laughs> We have the ethical responsibility to create positive change for our communities, to help elected officials understand the connection between health and design, and to push the public sector to demand health-promoting places. AIA architects lead, engage, and promote ambitious agendas that make the world a better place. Whether you've already jumped in with both feet or if this is your first look at health promoting design, I hope that this course reignites the core commitment we have as architects to protect and enhance society, health, safety, and welfare. This course offers insights into the world of public health and explores opportunities for you to directly and indirectly influence the health of your neighborhood, your greater community, and the world at large. This course is part of a series established by AIA to focus on the intersection of design and public health. We will explore the architect's opportunities to make change directly on projects and within your firms. And we will also explore the indirect influence architects have on community and practice.
What do we mean by public health or even health itself? Andy Dannenberg has surfed the waves of both worlds of public health and architecture. I sat down with him to learn more about what public health is, what public health professionals do, and the important linkage back to architecture. So Andy, can you start out by telling us a little bit more about yourself? Thank you, Liz. I'm a physician at the, on the faculty at the University of Washington with appointments in both um, environmental health and in urban planning. Um, I've been in public health for about 30 years. About 15 years ago, I was working at this inertia disease control, and we started looking at what affects health and realized that the built environment affects people's behavior and therefore affects health. For example, if you want people to walk, you have to give them a physical place to walk. You need to build those sidewalks. So we started realizing we needed to interact with the people who do build the physical environment. And we reached out to architects and urban planners and transportation professionals. And since then, have been working with those groups to help work on raising their awareness of how health is influenced by the built environment that they design. Can you start off, you, you mentioned public health. Can you just tell us what public health is, define it, and then how is that different from medical health? Okay. Um, public health looks at the health of populations as compared to medical care that takes care of one patient at a time. The difference is the individual physician taking care of one patient um, can treat one disease and has an impact at the level of that single patient. Public health says what's going on in the population. Where is there a problem on a larger scale? What can, and what can we do about it? There are three major areas of public health that, that accomplish this by looking at populations. The first one is assessment. How do we tell if there's a problem? How do we know that there's an obesity epidemic? Well, obviously, you need to have gathered data to tell that something is going on to know there's an obesity epidemic. The single physician who sees a few obese patients has no way of knowing what the trend in, in society is at, at that time. The second part is policy development. Once we have identified what problems are going on, how do we set policies that make a difference? So for example, if we have a vaccine preventable disease, can we set a policy that helps get people vaccinated? Can we set standards so that you get clean water when you, you want to drink water? The third is assurance, and that is once we have some standards and have some policies, how do we make sure that they are actually occurring and, and being enforced? So for example, if you go in a restaurant, you wanna know that that uh, restaurant's kitchen is clean. And as long as we have a food inspection service, which falls under public health, you can walk into that restaurant and comfortably eat there without you know, going back in and inspecting the, the kitchen yourself. Of uh, to give you one more, a specific example would be a patient with asthma. You have a, a patient, say your own child, goes into the doctor with various symptoms. The physician uh, listens to the symptoms, examines the child, prescribes medication, and treats that individual patient, your, your child. What the public health world would look at, well, what caused that asthma? What are the bigger factors behind uh, the, the asthma cases that are occurring? What scale are they occurring? That's, that's some of the um, assessment of how much is out there doing some of the research, what's causing it? Well, we can find, for example, that uh, what kind of carpet you use that uh, has mites in the carpet can be a, a, an asthma generator. Uh, is there indoor smoking that's affecting asthma in children? So these various factors on the larger scale that then can lead to policies that affect um, the factors that are influencing asthma and start to affect asthma in the larger population. So to tie that to architecture, with, with the asthma example, as, as mentioned, what kind of rugs are used or not used in affordable housing can affect asthma in the children who may be living in that housing. And so that a standard that can be set with, with evidence from public health is the architects then can set standards for designing uh, affordable housing that might use no carpeting or a kind of carpeting that, that has, has fewer elements in it that could um, induce asthma. So in the early years of the field, architects were involved with solving societal problems. Um, for example, um, infectious diseases or uh, helping to reduce poverty through the design of a city. Um, they've been doing this for years and years. What's new today for architects? You are quite correct. There was a lot of interaction between architects and public health perhaps a century or so ago. And Architects and public health work together on such things as water and sanitation made a big difference in people's health as the designers of water and sanitation and other parts of the city um, gave people healthier environments to work with. What's happened over that 
since then is that the two fields have gradually kind of drifted apart. And what we're focused on now is trying to reinvigorate the collaborations between the fields. Okay. What we can do from the health world is look at what are some of the health implications of how uh, places are designed, anything from buildings to, to whole cities. Um, simple examples would be if you're building a road, the health person can look at that and say, we need sidewalks. We want to encourage physical activity. A sidewalk should be added to that road design that the transportation person may not have put in there. Another example would be if we're, we're building an apartment complex that are relatively expensive apartments, but we're displacing low-income persons at the time we're building that, that fancier apartment building. The health person can say, well, could we work with you to get some affordable replacement housing built for the people who are being displaced at, at the time that, that new apartment's being built? So before we get deep into the role of the architect, let's take a step back and um, talk a little bit about the drivers of health. Um, I've heard used uh, this term, the determinants of health. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means exactly, and then how do those um, determinants influence health? Um, there are many factors that influence health. We have social, economic, cultural, environmental factors, all of which influence health. The one we can't do a lot about is genetics, but that's only part of the picture what our health is going to be. On the individual levels, we make a lot of behavioral choices. We decide how much activity we'll get, what we're going to eat, how we spend our time, where we spend our time, what we do when we're there. On the community level, decisions are made about what our physical environment looks like, what, what's the quality of our air, what's the quality of our water. And all of those are decisions being made at some level by someone. And all of them have, have an impact on health. Architects and planners and transportation professionals are making a lot of those decisions, particularly for the physical environment. And so they, by the decisions they're making, are influencing our health. There's been a number of studies trying to document what proportion of our health is influenced by these various factors. And the largest single group tends to be the social and economic factors that determine what our health will be like. Okay. But medical care is sometimes seen as maybe only 20%. One of the smaller contributors to our overall health is medical care because all these other factors have so much influence on health. And built environment and the physical environment are, are part of that list that have a substantial impact on health. So Andy, how should architects think about these determinants of health within the context of design? Architects should start with acknowledging that design does affect health. A lot of the training that architects get does not include much on health, or what they do receive often indicates that health implies health care and design of health care facilities. So it's an important message that everything done in design has some impact on health beyond just health care facilities. When architects are looking at how to do healthy design, one of the sources they might look at are the several certification systems that exist such as FitWell and the Well Building Standard. And these certification systems have within them a number of criteria that whether you're actually being certified or not, those criteria that they include in the certification systems are working toward healthy design and, and make a lot of sense for, for good design. That's great. So Andy, if we could, just tell us what is it architects should do? A number of things that architects can do. Architects work with environments ranging from large to small, so they need to do things at those different levels. One area where they can work is just reaching out to public health professionals so that there's some interaction with people who will look at things from the health point of view. Ideally, there'd be more collaboration between architects and urban planners. Urban planners tend to work on a little bit larger scale than architects, but where architects build buildings, the context and the area around where those buildings are has a major impact on health. Urban planners are often setting that context around the building, so if there's more interaction between architects and urban planners, it would help get better environments physically around the buildings the architects are doing. Architects need to look at the basics of healthy design and realize that building codes are really a, a bare minimum for healthy design. Building codes are mostly designed to prevent adverse impacts. So for example, they're often designed around safety. So you want a handrail, you want adequate indoor lighting. Um, but they, building codes typically are not uh, built, designed at the level to, to promote health. Um, the other thing architects can do is 
find ways for more interaction with public health. In the ideal world, a large architecture firm would have someone with some public health training working in the firm so that those interactions with health can occur on a regular basis. That could be somebody with an MPH that they hire to provide a health lens to decisions they're making, or it could be an architect who is interested in that broader field and, and gets a little, some public health training and is able to serve both as an architect and provide a health lens on, on decisions that are being made. So what I hear you're saying is that um, not only is there an, a chance for um, architects and designers to influence health, but that they can seek out um, public health professionals to help them make their designs healthier. Yeah, definitely. The architects can seek out public health and try to improve health that way. Um, in my ideal world, you would have both everyone in public health getting some exposure to how design works, as well as everyone in the design world learning something about public health, and it would really help collaboration between the two fields if everyone in their training got some exposure to the other field. Architects can try calling a local health official um, to get some guidance, and I think in some cities they will find a good reception um, from that public health official. In other places they may find that public health has not paid that much attention to design and may have more difficulty at a local health department finding somebody who has the interest or knowledge to, to help them with healthy design. You know, the other thing that occurs to me is um, there's, there's public health data on the web. I mean, you can go to cdc.gov and find out, for example, um, obesity rates for a certain zip code or, um, uh, you know, diabetes uh, rates for that, for that area. Then that, you know, is that the best way to find out what the, you know, public health uh, determinants are in your area or you know are, is there some other way to find out like what are the biggest problems wherever it is that I'm practicing I think that's an excellent source that there's quite a, a good bit of public health uh, statistics available on the web so you can find out what the major health problems are in a particular area what's needed is how to translate that into the decisions that yes. you're making and that's where some of these criteria for a health promoting design criteria can, can, can be valid. Can really help, okay. Let me give a few specific examples of the types of things that architects Perfect. can do. Um, the simplest one probably for architects is, is build a stairway that is attractive for use. And it, there are many buildings you can go into where the stairway is well hidden or around the corner or locked or not very attractive and the elevator is what's right in front of you, and you really aren't being given a choice. If you design the building so that the stairway is what you see first, and it's attractive and it's available, um, and the elevator has to be available, but it doesn't have to be the first thing you see when you walk in the building. That's a design issue, and it actually does influence behavior. Um, another area is a whole set of principles called crime prevention through environmental design, or SEPCAD. Okay. And that is worth looking up and looking through what some of the principles are, but a, a key part of that is, is eyes on the street. If you build a place that people can see what is going on around them, people feel more comfortable being there. And so again, that's a design issue both for the building as well as the, the surroundings around the building. Another design issue within the building is daylighting, that it is actually more comfortable when you're sitting in a place where there's some daylight and you're not entirely under artificial light. And that's very much a design issue of how the building's put together. There's also energy implications of how much daylighting uh, limits the amount of artificial light you're gonna, you're gonna need. Um, one of the areas where we really encourage the architect to be working with the planner is for the, the area around the site where the building is being built because we want people walking and biking and, and getting some physical activity. It's partly in the building and using those attractive stairs that got built in, but it's also is the building physically surrounded by places that encourage walking. Um, so there's just some examples of things that architects can do specifically in their, their design practice. Thanks, Andy. There is a lot of recent media attention on rising healthcare costs and government spending, but do we as architects have a part to play in improving the situation? Dr. Andrew Ibrahim, a physician and health policy researcher, cuts through the noise and explains the opportunity. Currently healthcare, we spend more than $3 trillion a year. That's more than double that we spent a decade ago and currently represents 20 cents on every dollar. In addition to being a lot of money right now, 
It's concerning that the rate is increasing, prompting a lot of interest from both policymakers and insurers on how to reduce the cost of healthcare. Alongside this trend of healthcare becoming more expensive, um, as a society, we're getting older. Um, the percent of adults that are over the age of 65 is going to double in the next two decades, and roughly a third of Americans will be that old, which will fundamentally change the way we need to organize healthcare, but also organize our communities um, and the way we engage in society. As someone who works in the hospital a lot, I can tell you how well a patient does has much more to do with where they go home after surgery than anything I do for them in the operating room. Um, just to give you an example, I can think of a patient who, two patients that I operated on recently, uh, both who had similar injuries, um, having gunshots to their leg. Um, unfortunate situation. Um, and, one, and they both had similar injuries. They both had surgery and they both did fine after surgery. Um, and I could tell you as they're leaving the hospital, just based on what neighborhood they were going to, I could almost tell you in my gut who was going to come back with a complication and who was going to go home and do fine and flourish and recover really well from the injury. And so now the money that would normally go to hospitals and doctors for patients' care, part of that pie is being divided to ask hospitals, how well are you doing to make sure patients in their community have access to these essential things? Because if we're putting so much money in the hospital and patients aren't doing well, um, it's probably not the best way to spend the money. So slowly you're seeing a trend that more and more money um, is moving outside of healthcare and moving into communities to improve health. And the theme you'll hear a lot is this idea of shifting from volume to value. It doesn't matter how many patients you got in and out of the hospital. What really matters is how well is the health of the community in the patients that you're serving? And what's the real value of the services you're delivering? They may be healthcare services, um, or they may more likely in the future be uh, how healthy their environment is, their exposures uh, to different um, toxins or environmental hazards. Um, and those are things that healthcare systems are now thinking about as they plan for the future. Uh, so keeping those in mind, let me give you a sense of three strategies that I think are sort of overall important for architects to think about as they try to become more central stakeholders in healthcare. So the first strategy that I think we really need to own and think about um, is finding out what really works. Finding out, did this design work? Did adding this park make people more physically active? Did increasing transportation help people get to their appointments that they were trying to do? So one of the things you're probably thinking about is, you know, how do I convince my client that thinking about end results is the right way to approach this? Well, let me just tell you in, in my own practice, when I see somebody who's going to have surgery with me, I see them in clinic two or three months before we plan the operation. We talk about different scenarios. We do the operation. I see them every day after the operation for the week they're in the hospital or a few days. Um, and then I see them at one month, three months, six months, a year, and two years. If they're a cancer patient, every year for five. And that is a standard part of care. And I think if I told any of my patients that the day after surgery, I was just going to walk out and they're kind of on their own, um, I think most patients would be upset with that. Um, and unfortunately, that seems to be what a lot of clients are doing uh, with their new facility buildings. They spend months or years planning a facility. Uh, they get multiple firms involved. And then once opening day hits, they say, thank you, and we run off. And there's no energy or resources dedicated to a post-occupancy evaluation to really think about, is this building working the way we thought it was? Is this new strategy to engage the community in health working the way we thought it was? Um, and I think by using the clinical analogy that providers would never leave a patient the day after surgery, uh, seems the same way that you wouldn't leave, an architect shouldn't leave a building the day after it opens. And that should be a standard part of the contract to say, we know your building opens in 2020, we're going to stay with you till 2022, because we know in that first two years there's going to be four or five things that you're going to want to modify and change to make your building work better, and that's just a standard part of how we do our business. Uh, so one of the other strategies I think is incredibly important for architects to engage and embrace as a real opportunity is that because healthcare is so fragmented, there are so many stakeholders in healthcare. There are surgeons, there are primary care doctors, there are clinicians, there are nutritions, there are community workers, there are social services. And all of these are still working in a fragmented fashion, but almost all of them more recently are consolidating and being owned by one company. So it's actually an awesome opportunity to think, how would you redesign a health system knowing that you have all these resources now under one umbrella, uh, knowing that the focus from payment policy is to move health outside of the hospital and provide care in the community 
and maybe even keep people out of the hospital and preventative services. That's going to become the, a lot of the target goals of many both healthcare insurers and payers. Uh, I'll just give you one example that's, incre- that's striking um, in Minnesota with social housing. Uh, there are many insurance companies now who they recognize that homeless patients are often the most highest utilizers of emergency services. So they'll actually pay for social housing to give them a roof, something to eat, and access to um, basic services because it helps keep them out of the hospital. And actually the cost of providing social housing is far less than them coming into the emergency room frequently. Um, So it's a unique realization that a lot of payers are having, which is a great opportunity to, to talk to your client, figure out their population, figure out their patient needs and say, hey, by actually looking at the community and the health of the community and preventing people from coming into the hospital, it actually could save your system a lot of money. Uh, And so I think the third strategy is to really widen your scope and scale of what you think about as health and think about health in all designs. The built environment has an effect on our health and well-being. The relationship is further compounded by unique cultural, demographic, and geographic considerations. As such, making the connection between the two often extends beyond most of our day-to-day practices. To help make the connection easier, the AIA has identified six evidence-based approaches to health that architects can control through design practices and policies. Social connectedness, natural systems, sensory environments, environmental quality, physical activity, and safety. Said another way, these are starting points to more consciously consider how your designs can advance health. Social connectedness, also referred to as social capital, refers to the relationships that bind people together. It includes attitudes such as trust, and behaviors like voting or helping a neighbor in need. Social connectedness is a public health priority because it helps communities and societies function more effectively, and oftentimes it predicts higher levels of happiness and well-being. The promotion of natural systems is a public health priority because it provides stress relief, accelerates recuperation time, and promotes healthy eating, physical activity, and social activity. Biophilia is a primary example of natural systems in design. Sensory environments refer to the perceived olfactory, tactile, acoustic, and aesthetic quality of a space. Designing a variety of sensory experiences contributes to our physical, mental, and emotional well-being. We asked biophilia expert Judith Heerwagen with the Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings to talk to us about natural systems and sensory environments. Okay, one of the things that I think about when we talk about natural systems is to um, ask why we should be so affected by natural systems now. We live in built environments, we live in urban environments for the most part. Um, And my background in evolutionary psychology and Uh, behavioral ecology has really informed this. If you think about our evolutionary history, buildings are very new um, to our experience. It might be 10,000 years, but that's relatively new in evolutionary um, perspective. But we lived as hunters and gatherers for a long time, and that has kind of informed how I think about things, what it is we respond to, why we respond to that, what potential impact it has. When we talk about biophilia, we're really talking about connection to nature and in a positive way. Biophilia um, essentially means love of life and living things. And it was popularized by Ed Wilson in his little book called Biophilia, which talked about our innate connection to nature and our fascination with nature, Um, particularly the aspects of nature that make us feel well and support us. So that's how I'm using the term. Um, It's a very broad term. It doesn't, um, it can talk about nature in terms of real things. We can talk about in terms of all of the things I've talked about, daylight, um, it can be ongoing to connection to nature that isn't real. They can be photographs, they can be paintings, um, other things too, That, but there are lots of ways to do it. And the value of a, a picture is that it reminds you of something else that you, know, you can see being in that. If you can put yourself into the painting or the picture, um, it can have a positive effect. So in places where you can't have real nature, you can do it in many ways. But um, 
And then the term biophilic design is really about how do you bring those aspects of biophilia uh, into the built environment. Okay, when we talk about natural systems, um, there's obviously a real strong connection to sensory experience. Um, it's not just um, things, but it is our, how we use our senses, what we respond to in the environment, what we like, what we're afraid of, um, those kinds of things. And there's some really interesting work going on now in sensory, um, in the sensory world, looking at sensory variability. Um, often our environments are just completely bland. The, the daylight or the interior light is the same. All the surfaces are beige and gray and, you know, those color, kind of colors. So the people are beginning to ask, what difference does it make if we treat the sensory environment very differently? Um, and some of the really interesting work going on now is with thermal uh, factors. And there is a, a, a movement to understanding more about sensory variability with respect to the thermal environment. Um, and there is a term for this transition between warm and, and cold or you know going the other way too. Um, it's called allesthesia which has to do with um, how we perceive pleasure and how we experience pleasure. It is actually a pleasurable experience that is um, driven by centers in the brain. Um, this isn't subjective, it really is a physiological response that has an emotional component to when you go from a really cold outdoors into a warm inside or vice versa. It feels really good. Um, it doesn't necessarily last, it can be very transitory, um, but the, that sensory change is really important, fundamental to our experience of the environment. The first three approaches we covered, social connectedness, access to natural systems, and sensory environments, are often priorities in early design. They come into play when we site the building and program the space. Environmental quality spans from early site design to later consideration of systems and controls. To further explain environmental quality, I return to Judith Heerwagen. She kindly shared her success stories from the GSA portfolio. When we're talking about environmental quality indoors, we're talking about lots of things. It can be the, um, the ambient conditions, all of the, uh, the conditioning of the environment, the air, the water, the um, acoustics and so forth. But it's also what we bring into the building, the materials that we bring in, um, the, how we use those materials and cleaning um, systems and all of that really contributes to that indoor environmental quality. It's not just one thing. Um, and we need to look at what we use for cleaning when we do the cleaning. Um, because if we do it at night, it might have a lower impact on the people. Um, but if we do it during the day, then we don't have to use as much electricity at night to keep um, the, you, the people able to see what they're doing. So I think that there is, it's a systems approach. It's not just looking at one thing at, at a time. It's really looking at how you, how you optimize all of these things to get rid of the harms and then um, optimize them for doing good. Physical activity refers to exercise, recreational activity, and everyday activities including chores. Physical activity is a public health priority because it promotes individual choices and habits that reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and other health problems. Often, barriers to physical activity include a lack of access to infrastructure, including safe playgrounds, pedestrian amenities, and open, accessible stairs. Lower income and older populations are often most affected by those barriers. Many resources including the Active Design Guidelines, identify opportunities for architects to promote physical activity through multimodal transportation systems, prominent stairs, and varied park and recreation spaces. Physical activity is closely related to safety. Many design features actually bridge both approaches. As an architect, safety should be inherent in everything we do, but when we think about it, in the broader context of health, the opportunities are endless. Safety refers to protection from physical or psychological harm, whether caused by accidental injury or crime. Architects can remove both real and perceived impediments to physical activity, such as walking. Creating environments that are perceived as safe can help alleviate and reduce anxiety and stress linked to hypertension, hyperglycemia, and obesity. Safety is perhaps the best regulated tenant of the architect's professional obligation 
to the public. Consider fire and building codes, but it's also an opportunity to advance healthier spaces. Now is your chance to dive more deeply into specific examples related to these approaches. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. Hopefully you got a lot out of the video and we're looking forward to kind of continuing the conversation now with Gail. Um, Gail, I'm not seeing your here. I'm here. Okay. Thanks. Great. Um, well, thank you for joining us today. Um, I think we're just going to jump right into it. Gail is a lead fellow and the co-director of the Center for Maximum Potential Building Systems. Uh, and just to get everyone kind of on board uh, with who you are and what you do, we're going to have a few icebreaker questions and then we'll kind of launch into uh, the heart of the, the matter. Um, so first icebreaker question, describe what you do in three words. That's a really tough one, Ashley. Uh, I was challenged by it and I went through a few different rounds of what I might say and I came up with these three words. Um, the first is imagine. The second is do, and the third is love. And I use those words in the most generous way. Um, I would say uh, they all really inspire me to think about the ways to stretch a sense of what's possible, to be ready to be curious and to know that we will only make change happen if we imagine what might be possible and then to have love really be the inspiration for everything that we do. I love that. I, I really, I think it's important. I think one of the things that drew me to the conversation on health in design is really the very personal nature of it. Um, and so I think it's important to really bring that empathy and that lens. Yeah. Um, uh, what book is on your nightstand right now? What are you reading? Well, as you might imagine, there's more than one. Um, yeah. The book I happen to be reading right now is Beloved by Toni Morrison. I read it a long time ago, and over the last many months, I thought it would be good for me to sort of reconnect to some real classics. And so that's my current one, and I am thoroughly enjoying it. I, I love the just the flow of the book, the wonderment of it, and her, Toni Morrison's just exquisite writing. Um, so I always try to read something that's going to inspire me to not just think in a, in a way that stretches me beyond my own context, but also how words matter and how you can become so uh, just kind of wrapped up into um, the beauty of words. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I love asking that question because I love making a list of all the books I need to read. <laughs> yeah, put that one on your list. It's great. Great. Um, well, you have served on the boards of and as chair of USGBC, GBCI. You were the founding chair of Lead for Healthcare Core Committee. Um, you've been recognized for many, many leadership roles in um, the design and health space and sustainability space. Uh, so I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about how you've seen the industry sort of approach to design for health. Um, evolve over the last uh, 20 or so years when you first started with USGBC to now and sort of how that has shaped um, and inter how your work has kind of intersected with that transformation. Yeah, so it has been about 20 years. I joined the USGBC board in uh, 2001, so we're precisely there. Uh, and I often think of things in terms of decades. So let's say we're two decades into this. Um, when I joined the USGBC board, part of my motivation was a recognition that there really was not an explicit addressing of human health considerations related to the built environment and specifically the work that was um, being generated by, by USGBC through LEAD and, and otherwise. So I saw it as an opportunity to begin to establish some bridges. I was by no means an expert in health or public health. Um, didn't have that training, but I did see it as a huge gap that had obvious reasons to begin to pull people together. And as Annie Dannenberg said, you know, if you trace back 
to the earlier part of the last century, um, the recognition that there was an intrinsic relationship between design and public health was clearly there and established. And so part of what I found that needed to happen was to both create a sense of what is the explicit opportunities that design practitioners have in terms of promoting and advancing health, um, but also to begin to establish a sense of a shared vocabulary and a literacy. So again, as Andy was saying, you know, ideally people in design professions would have some training and background in, in public health and vice versa, people in public health in, in design. I think that is now starting to happen. And so while it was sort of a blank slate 20 years ago, clearly we've crossed the chasm and now see so many ways where health is intrinsic to how we think about design and the opportunities to influence health in a positive way by decisions we make as designers. Um, so I think there's been a tremendous evolution of thinking and doing. Um, I'll also say that 20 years ago, uh, it was considered to be kind of an off the table topic to bring up health. Um, at that time, it was very much viewed as being a kind of opening up a box of liability. If you started to say, here's a relationship, decisions you make about materials, for example, can influence health. And it was really sort of pushed aside to the point where some of us who were beginning to articulate these concepts um, were actually explicitly asked to not use the word health. So just think about what happens when there is a broad consensus that this is actually a positive and beginning to just turn the tide on viewing it as an opportunity instead of a risk. So a lot of changes happened in a relatively short period of time. And all of this I think is manifested in, you know, how we can now have conversations where there is a sense of a shared vocabulary and um, basic concepts and relationship in terms of evidence-based findings of making certain design decisions with an expectation that there will be positive and beneficial health outcomes. Yeah, I think kind of continuing that line of thinking, um, the, vi the video we heard the speakers talking a lot about um, the determinants of health. And as you were saying, sort of making this recognition of the the ways in which the design community has um, agency over health and kind of not shying away from that, but seeing that as an opportunity uh, rather than a liability. And um, you've described your work as being at the intersection of sustainable design and health. And when we were preparing for this um, session, you brought up the Austin uh, Climate Equity Plan for 2020, which we're really hopeful the city council will adopt fully this summer, um, but we've been sort of stepping through the goals of that plan um, this year with our monthly COPE meetings. Um, and we're having ongoing conversations um, in our chapter and across the country really about environmental justice. And you had mentioned that really the climate equity plan and environmental justice are, are fundamentally conversations about, about health. Can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by that and, and sort of what the relationship is between sort of climate equity and health? Well, I think we see it in many ways. One of them is that um, it's clear that um, low wealth communities are disproportionately affected adversely by climate change. And we see climate change playing out. In fact, there was an article in the paper today about Environmental Protection Agency recognizing that it's even more rapid and more widespread um, today than we thought about it you know, just in the recent past. So, I think the sense that a climate challenged planet is going to disproportionately affect low wealth communities um, is pretty clear and evident. Um, it's also, I think, if you take it in a more micro scale, understanding um, issues about um, you know, heat waves very specifically and people living in houses that are not properly ventilated or conditioned, especially as we have an increasing population in hot, humid climates, you know, people moving to Texas and other states um, from colder states that we know very clearly that um, the, the death toll, literally the death toll um, disproportionately affects low wealth communities. We see in examples like um, Hurricane Katrina 
what happens to an entire city um, that has, you know, clear, very significant economic disparities. Um, what happens to those populations? And we see, you know, very recently in Texas with the with the the February winter storm, um, how people even in Austin, right, are still living in certain certain housing facilities, aren't even able to get back into them um, because of a, a tragic occurrence of um, you know being uh, the whole infrastructure for energy being frozen out and then also the problems with water. So I think it's I think it's very clear. Um, I also think it's kind of inspires that that recognition as has come up a lot in the context of COVID from the World Health Organizations and others that is if no one is safe, um, no one is safe unless everyone is safe. And I think you could almost extend that to say, you know, no one is healthy unless everyone is healthy. We need to inspire the reality that it is everyone's opportunity to have access to health care. It is a human right to be healthy. And so what are all of the triggers that can be activated and leveraged, um, you know, for the design community in the work that we do that can help us move towards that as actually a a realistic reality. Um, and I think a lot of the pieces are there to achieve it. It's part of it is like mindset, like, is it in our box to do that work or not? And so the more that we can enter our conversations as designers and people affiliated with designers um, to put the issue on the table. Um, and I think, you know, just as as people said on the on the video, um, designers have a public health opportunity. Um, some people have said, and this was said at Greenbuild several years ago, um, you know, design communities, communities should view themselves as public health practitioners. So, you know, relative to the determinants of health, um, if so much is in the realm of outcome associated with decisions that designers make, then yes, it is determinant of public health and we all should be ready to sort of embrace that as the opportunity that it is and begin to weave a storyline through the, you know, from the beginning of the project all the way through of how to actually be responsible stewards of that. Um, one of the things when we worked on developing the Lead for Healthcare and its predecessor, the Green Guide for Healthcare, was to establish a specific health mission statement that every project would need to craft at the beginning with basically everyone at the table developing it. That is still part of a requirement for Lead for Healthcare. And I can share that knowing what's involved with, with sort of raising the question and engaging everyone on the team, ownership, contractor, engineers, architects, interior people, food service, all the people involved, um, users of the project, to create that explicit statement and then use it as sort of a banner to return to as you're going through the design process and through construction, um, you know, how do you honor that? And it's possible to do because you've done the first act of actually creating the statement. If it's sort of a wishy-washy, yeah, we're all wanting to do health promotion, but don't get into the specifics. I think that's where things sort of just don't congeal and you don't get a cohesive, clear, precise sense of what's the direction we're going in, in terms of a, a kind of a spine of health throughout the project. So I think those early steps, the intentionality of it, the explicitness of it is really consequential um, to get to have meaningful and measurable outcomes. And also a way to challenge the team, right? Because if something's come up along the way, use a staircase as an example, as was talked about, right? If a staircase is put on the table as uh, something to consider, say from the lobby going up and have it be visible and attractive and something that will engage you to want to use that as your option. Um, if it's thrown out because it's too costly, then I think if you've already gone through a health mission, a health purpose statement, it's easy to sort of challenge the quick dismissal of it in a way that I think is more robust than if you're not as committed to really advancing health through the decisions that you make. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for that. I think um, there's a lot of really 
important content out there. And a lot of discussions happening right now as we're kind of living through a global health crisis uh, with the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I just wanted can to- say, Can I just say to that point, just, just to that point, Ashley, because um, I think it's also important to say as we've been obviously so focused and, and paying attention to everything that we need to related to COVID, it has not erased our chronic illness challenges, right? And so now we really have the double burden of everything that we're experiencing related to COVID um, and nothing really has diminished related to chronic diseases. In fact, they may have even been amplified because of it. So I think it's important to stay paying attention to all those influences that have exacerbated what we know has been a hugely burdensome reality of chronic disease as we're still managing and understanding what is, you know, the evolution of our relationship with the COVID virus. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, that's a great point. It's something that has really heightened our awareness of what impacts health and how our behavior and our environment has an impact on disease spread. Um, and so hopefully that will be a gateway to the conversation of all the other impacts and all the other agency that we can have for these other chronic um, diseases, as you mentioned. I just wanna remind people we have a few minutes left. If you do have a question you wanna pop in the Q&A, um, we'd love to hear from everyone on the call. Um, but we're happy to keep chatting as well if um, you know, no questions are kind of coming to mind. Um, A second. Ashley, there's a question in the Q&A. Okay, yeah, it's like um, Lauren is um, responding to some of the conversation here and um, saying there, there may be some, in, in some cases, some kind of over design of the, the idea of nature and sort of that um, more, uh, I guess, 20 year old definition of sustainability that's, that's really focused on kind of environmentalism and um, seems like part of this shift that you're talking about and what we can leverage in the conversation right now is sort of moving into a space where um, either that that kind of word sustainability is started to understand in a much broader context or that we are actually challenged to maybe pick a new word and kind of move in the direction of um, this conversation on environmental justice, climate equity, health, safety, you know, the conversation we made. No one is healthy unless everyone is healthy. And that includes healthy planet, but there's also a lot more layers to that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's really an intersectional issue. A lot of people are, you know, kind of stringing together climate, health, and equity, um, in no particular order. I think one of the big learnings in my mind over, you know, work we've been doing over, you know, a couple decades on this is, it's not about trade offs anymore. We have to get more elegant about bringing all of this up to a level where we're saying we're um, we're positively advancing these issues together. Um, the the trade-off mindset I think is really obsolete. There's too much at risk when we let ourselves do that. And I don't think um, the this moment really allows for that anymore. So moving beyond complacency to say, well, that's just the way it is to being more proactive and saying that's not acceptable anymore. Let's create this new platform where we're advancing these say three considerations at least, um, and we can measure the outcome. So I think that you know the issue of measure manage, um, I think there's really value with that, and it is one of the I think keys of you know we advance market transformation by doing things at scale, and one of the opportunities to do things at things at scale as a whole profession is through using certain rating systems. And so I think also like the injecting these rating systems, you have well as the most obvious example where its focus is on health and well-being in a more singular way, but certainly LEAD and others are advancing those issues in a more integrated, broader way. 
Um, and I think the broader approach in my mind in terms of advancing the market transformation in a holistic way is, is where I think that the, the, where we should be. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Well, we're right at one o'clock. I do um, want to give you a chance for sort of one final uh, takeaway. Um, so if anyone's able to, to hang on the line, um, I'll just have Gail close with some sort of uh, words of advice or um, what, what can we do right now leaving this call? What's the most important action step uh, we can all take for ourselves, for our firms uh, to kind of continue and advance this conversation? To be succinct, I would just say to recognize that decisions that are made are influencing and consequential to health. And so take that recognition as a basis to advance an active positioning of that issue in every project. Great, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. I, I personally wish we could just stay on the line all day and talk about this. Um, but I'm very excited for all of us to get a chance to go out and kind of use uh, this information. Kendall just posted a bunch of resources in the chat if you're interested in um, diving into some of those rating systems that were mentioned in the video or that uh, Gail had just mentioned and some other books and resources that you can check out if you wanna continue this conversation. You can also check out the full series, the full AIU series, um, which this video was a part of. Um, and they have more resources there. And we'd also love to continue the conversation with you through our events. So here's just a little list of some of the things we've got coming up. Please uh, stay tuned to our website. This recording will be posted on the AI website uh, for you to reference and share with your friends and colleagues. We'd love to continue spreading this conversation far and wide. Um, so thank you all so much for being here and have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, Ashley. Great to talk. Thank you, Gail. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, way to go.